All right, everyone, welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Uh, it's nice to get back. We have more Google News to talk about, but some other stuff. Let's hit what you always wait for, the news. Now, Guy, June 26th, Google came out with an update on maximizing performance on search around query matching, specifically around brand. You and I have been very, very critical, hypercritical of Google and the conflation of brand terms. What does this exactly change? Well, uh, it's supposed to give us a little bit more control over uh, how uh, brand in, is included or excluded and queries. There are four different updates and we'll drop a link in the show notes. But, um, you know, essentially it's they're tra- it's a response to the problem that we've been harping on, which is, is that uh, there's not a lot of control over uh, showing and excluding and including brands. So So this, you know, we've seen massive increases in the cost that people are paying for their own branded queries. There's a lot of confusion and conflation and deliberate conflation on Google's part. Um, It will be interesting to see. And by the way, let's be clear. This um, this is a pay per click thing. It is not an LSA thing. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Still pure opacity in LSA is still. Yeah. Yeah. We have no, which means we don't know what the hell is going on. Um, (laughs) It's true. Um, but so we'll see if, if some of these changes can actually improve, uh, the cost pers uh, on the brand branded side of things. Okay. Yeah, this might be a segment in the future that we'll go deeper on, but today we just wanted to give it a shout. So if you're a PPC person, make sure you're on this, these changes. Okay. Um, messaging on Google profiles, rest in peace, baby. Goodbye. Why do you think Google has killed messaging on the Google business profile? Well, there's a lot of theories. Some of it relates, I think, to the actual technology itself and working across platforms and encryption and security stuff. My hunch is, this is my, I'm going to put it out there. I think you're going to see messages come back, um, but maybe in a different product. You know, some of the other complaints are that these messages are small business owners are just getting spammed heavily in them. And so there's not a lot, of, a lot of value. But I know a lot of businesses that they rely pretty heavily on the engagement with their Google business profile messaging. And so uh, if you've been if you've been a firm that's relied on that, you know, heads up. And I would start already. In fact, we're already too late because beginning July 15th, customers can't start new chat conversations with businesses. And on July 31st, the chat feature will be removed. So I would, I might put in your Google business profile, something that highlights like, Hey, we know that there's no more messaging, but here's how to contact us. Obviously phone numbers, maybe scheduling links, appointment links, maybe put something in your post or your FAQs so that if you had been relying on this uh, and it's going away, you're telling people, Hey, we're still available in these other ways. Okay, and you can, and, and you should probably download all of your record, your history, right? So you can use Google Takeout and get all of your historical uh, business profile chat data. I think that's probably something good to retain. I think the other flavor of this is there are some, especially in legal. Now, Google doesn't only think about the legal market, but especially in legal, there are many situations in which people do not want to physically talk to you, audibly talk to you when they're contacting a lawyer. <laughs> physically talk to you. <laughs> physically, um, <laughs> and so. You need to be thinking about for those of you who have prospects who don't necessarily want to pick up the phone right now and chat and sorry and talk. Um, what what are you making it easy for them to contacting to contact you in an alternative method? Totally. Uh, and we don't know if this is going to impact LSAs yet. Yeah. So we'll we'll find out. We'll, f- we'll find we'll let out you know on once, the 31st. once it's already happened. <laughs> yeah. Right. I my, my okay, hunch hey, is that it won't. My hunch is they're still going to have messaging. It's, it's too much money. There's too much money, too, too much, much confusion. Money. No, mo- no money in Google business profile messaging, but money in LSA messaging for the Google. And the beautiful thing with, for if you live in Mountain View and work in Mountain View, uh, you can message multiple people at the same time, which means you can quadruple charge for those individual messages. Just saying, just throwing that out there. Okay, hey, I'm seeing you twice in the upcoming months. We're gonna be at the Auto Crash Litigation Summit and uh, we're also gonna be at the Law Firm Summer Reboot Camp. Um, it's going to be great. Looking forward to spending time with you. If any of our listeners are going to be at any of those events, although the, the reboot camp is virtual, so, uh, you'll all be there or none of you will be there depending on how you look at it, but I uh, would love to see you and Guy, I'm looking forward to spending more time with you in person. 
Yeah, and just for folks that are, if you're just so we're made it clear, it's the uh, 360 Advocacy is the auto crash litigation summit. You can see Conrad and I in Vegas in September. It's the 22nd to 24th. And then uh, it's Answering Legal is doing the uh, reboot camp. Uh, that's the virtual one. And that's going to be coming up. Um, I think Conrad and I are on a panel on July 24th, but it starts July 23rd through 26th. And then they're doing it again in August. So keep your eyes peeled if you want to hear some more from us. And finally, I want to congratulate you on showing up on Legal Rebels. I have never been on Legal Rebels. I remember when it came out, I want to say in 2007 or 8, I think is when Legal Rebels uh, became a thing. Um, and you're here. I'm going to read this because it's awesome. And you're not going to do your own crowing, so I'll crow for you. Welcome to the ABA Journal Legal Rebels podcast, where we talk to men and women who are remaking the legal profession, changing the way law is practiced and setting standards that will guide us into the future. Keep listening, dear listener. After the break, we are going to continue to guide you into the future. Hey, if you're checking us out on YouTube, please do hit that like and subscribe button. We'd love to hear from you. Drop a comment, ask a question, suggest a topic. And here's another episode that you might like to check out, which is Google's Algorithm Exposed. So I learned something new. If you're a Spotify listener, you can actually leave comments in the Spotify app. In fact, we recently got a question from Matt Stevens via Spotify. Google's algorithm exposed. Can you explain or point us to a resource that explains how exactly authorship is attributed and recognized on a given page? Do we just say in the byline written by X and link to their bio page? Thanks, Matt. We appreciate it. If you have questions about this episode or anything else, please do leave a comment in Spotify or YouTube. And of course, you can always contact on all of our various social media handles. Look for Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. And with Matt's question, Conrad, let's dive yeah. in and try to answer it. We are so grateful when listeners leave comments and ask questions. Talk to me about authorship. Authorship is a thing. I'm trying to incite Guy into annoyance here. I like no, the it fact is not. That Matt, <laughs> I like the <laughs> fact that Matt used the word authorship in his question. Um, I think what we should do to answer this question is first go over the history and theory and concept of authorship, and then we will talk or 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 expertise as as you would prefer to talk about it, um, and we can talk about why you and I um, use different words. Uh, but we, we will then go and then talk about the current state of play, because what you're asking for is what's, what to do now. But I think in order to understand what to do now, it is, it is probably a good thing to talk about what authorship slash expertise is and why we care. So you want to do that? Ahead. All right. You go. No, well, go I'm ahead. the philosopher. I'll, I'll give the philo go. philosophical go take. Go. Good. Go. If, if I were creating a search engine, okay. I was trying to organize, organize all of the world's information. It might be valuable to the people who use my search engine that I'm including the credibility, uh, the who is doing the publishing, right? Because if, you know, suppose you've, you're talking about special relativity, well, Guy's page on special relativity is probably not as valuable, credible, expert, et cetera, as Albert Einstein's page on special relativity. So that's the theory, right? The who publishes it matters. And so, Conrad, what in yeah. the past did Google try to do to solve this, or at least contribute to solving this issue? So I, I loved this when it came out. And when it came out, I knew it was going to be short-lived. But there was a thing that they created called authorship. And it was Relic was author. It was code that you could literally put on a piece of content and it identified who the author was. And it did that by pointing the author of that content. It would just point to that person's Google Plus profile. For those of you who are old in this industry, you'll remember the belly flop that was Google Plus. It turned out the only thing people were ever using it for was to establish authorship. And it never really took off to take on Facebook. Um, and it was very clever because all you'd have to do is like, here's my piece of content about, you know, absolute relativity. And I'm going to put code in there that then links back to um, uh, Albert Einstein's Google Plus profile. And that was a really, really cool concept. The problem with that, not just the fact that Google Plus 
uh, completely sucked. Oh, and in, in conjunction with that, and, and in order to actually, and it really made this take off, is in the SERPs, you would actually get a little picture of your Google Plus, your Google Plus picture would show up in the SERP. So there's a little picture of Conrad who wrote a brilliant article about why digital marketing agencies are so scummy, right? And it, my little picture would show up there, which made me feel really good about myself, um, which was cool, right? And it, and it really helped. And uh, there were studies that show that click-through rates went up when you had the little picture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The problem, of course, is because of SEOs ruined it. Um, and because it is code, I could take that page about uh, that I wanted to rank for, let's say, absolute relativity, and I could then change who the author was in the code. And that is completely gross and spammy. Um, and so what was happening, and FindLaw did this. I love, I love this example because it was so gross and so flagrant. They would sell you a website that they had built for, built and worked on and SEO'd for the guy across the street. And they would sell you that website and then they would just change the authorship code to point back to your new profile. So it would look like to Google that you had authored all of these articles. And that I'm not saying final was the reason that Google canceled this, but like the abuse of code, we've seen this over and over again. The abuse of code is why Google often takes away nice things from us. And so authorship was killed, I want to say, about 18 months after it launched. Well, in fairness, it, too, uh, Google got rid of Google Plus, too, which was being part of what they were doing with it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but like they could have, I mean, they could have, in, they could have done kept an the incarnation concept. of Google yep. Plus as a concept. Um, but because it is coded and because it was abused, my take is because it was abused by SEOs, they put a bullet in it. Except maybe they didn't. So, Guy, do you want to talk about eat and why you and I fight over the terms authorship versus eat? I do. Two, but first, let's e's. take a break. And we are back. And we're going to pick up now. Conrad laid out the historical framework for authorship. And as Conrad alluded to, that kind of authorship, the rel equals author, Google Plus version, is dead. So you can't do that. So now we're back to, all right, well, what is Google, how can Google try to distinguish content by author and does Google, Google care about expertise? Well, Google has a whole page about how you should be writing content for humans. And a big part of this uh, documentation talks about this concept of E E A T. And, you know, we're, we're not going to cover all of the creating helpful, reliable and purpose first content stuff, but we do want to talk about the, the who, because that's really when we're talking about authorship, that's the part of this conversation that matters from an E uh, E A T perspective. And so this is, I'm just going to read from the documentation on this. So consider evaluating your content in terms of who, how, and why as a way to stand course with what our systems seek to reward. Again, this is Google. So who created the content? Something that helps people intuitively understand the EEAT of content is when it's clear who created it. That's the who to consider. And when creating content, here are some of the who-related questions to ask yourself. Is it self-evident to your visitors who authored your content, right? So you know, and this is to, as uh, Matt asked, you know, is this as simple as putting a byline in? Like a byline certainly helps, right? Um, and one mistake that we see all the time is especially firms that outsource their content, um, you know, they'll, it'll either, I've seen it as bad as they didn't update the author bio in WordPress and it's just admin. So it just says admin written by admin, or maybe it says written by the firm, but you're right. not getting the who wrote this value um, if you don't actually make it self-evident to who published it. In fact, Google actually says the second thing, do the pages carry a byline where one might be expected? And so, you know, clearly if you're doing an article, having a byline that, you know, has your name in there, I think is valuable. Probably also some, maybe a short bio would probably be useful. The other thing that I will add here that is maybe not as evident is I would still use uh, author markup on your content. So, and we can put this in the uh, show notes as well, but Google provides best practices for author markup 
um, implemented by structured data, probably JSON LD. But I, I would, you know, again, the machines are still machines. They're they, they're trying to get smarter, but make it easier for the machines to know. And then the third thing that uh, Google recommends for this, uh, you know, uh, the who part of the uh, EEAT is. Do the bylines lead to further information about the author or authors involved, giving background about them and areas they write about? So this is the intersection of byline with your uh, attorney profile page, right? So if that's what you're going to, if you're going to have an attorney bio page on your website, and I'd be, you know, if you're publishing on uh, uh, industry publications, websites, um, you want to make sure that that's linking back to your, uh, your bylines linking back to that uh Uh, attorney bio page with information about you, what you publish on that kind of stuff. I think that that's, those are kind of the big three that we talk about uh, in the who context. Now that's just what Google publicly says about this, but there are all sorts of other things that I believe play a role in how they think about the who. And one of those things is brand recognition. You know, when, when people append your name, or the attorney's name or the firm name to their queries is the same thing we see with this Reddit uh, conundrum because Reddit's a brand that can actually impact also how Google thinks about you as an expert and your content. And so, you know, and we, we've even seen this with attorney sync where a non-brand query like law firm SEO, Google will suggest law firm SEO attorney sync because it's making that connection between our brand and the non-brand query. And so, because people, you know, people argue about this, is this EEAT even a thing? How can Google even do this? And I, and I think that it behooves lawyers to be obviously adding the byline stuff, but be thinking about how to generate users searching on brand queries and searching on brand queries that are modified with, um, you know, non-brand modifiers like practice area and city. All right, so I'm going to go to Matt's, the specifics of Matt's question. Um, Can you explain or point us to a resource that explains how exactly authorship is attributed and recognized on a given page? And so we've we've given you theory on this. Um, There are, and, and, and so I don't feel like there's a definitive guide of like, do these seven things. However, reading through the tea leaves, if you were working on building up your expertise or authorship um, and credibility in a given topic. Some of the ways that Google will go about doing that is, and they've they've done this, one of the signals that they've definitely sent is the um, social links on your Google business profile. For a while, they started adding those links, what they thought was accurate to Google business profiles. Um, They now enable you to do that directly. And I suspect that's because there was a lot of confusion between all the Robert Williams is of the world and figuring out which Robert Williams was the expert on SEO and which Robert Williams was the expert on, you know, mousetrap design or whatever it might be. Um, and so you can now actually define on your Google business profile, all of your social profiles in your social profiles. Typically people who are content creators will push that content on those social profiles, which makes it easy for a computer to understand and identify the, 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 a network of content that belongs to a single author. The other thing, Guy, that I think is not talked about all that much, but is, I think, very relevant to this conversation, it's not just about you publishing on your own piece of, your own blog at the risk of unearthing an old term. (laughs) Your own domain. So your own domain, thank you. Um, It's not a, it's really... Building expertise on an individual domain is is antithetical to the entire concept of why Google was really good at as a search engine to start with, because it was looking at a web, a literal web across the internet of expertise. And so part of that expertise is built by writing outside of your own content, right? And so for you and me, it's very, very blindingly obvious we should write things on technical publications we should write things about marketing on the american bar association those type of things are are fairly self-evident this is a component of building up your expertise and it's why google is looking at you know i'll connect the dots for you if you can't figure it out i post something on the american bar association about digital marketing I, i i mentioned that in all of my social profiles which helps Google understand who the author of that piece of content was. And the ABA is not going to have, 
you know, Joe, well, maybe they will. Well, let's hope not. Joe Schmo writes something up there. And so it starts to build up that profile of expertise and authorship. So this is, this is kind of the Guy and Conrad version of what we believe is being done based on what Google is talking about. And in fact, you know, that, that Google algo leak referenced this concept of expertise and authorship. Um, so I don't think this is going away. I think this is more important than we think it is. And it, it can be an underlooked, an underlooked, that's not even a word, an overlooked component of your SEO strategy. Yeah. And again, if, I, if you wanted additional reading on this, I would refer folks to Google Search Central and specifically their documentation on creating helpful, reliable people first content. You know, they go pretty deep. I, I, again, people say, you know, Google doesn't say anything about this. It's like, yeah, they do. It's there's all sorts of really valuable information, in my opinion, in here and questions you should ask to assess your content. And the second thing, the second place I would look in Google Search Central as an additional resource would be under the uh, featured guide section um, and specifically on the structured data features with respect to article. There's probably a couple other ones that are worth looking at. You know, if you're doing Q&A, uh, there's a couple other things that you probably want to mark up so that you're getting that quote unquote um, EEAT credit. Now, I, I will say this too, in case there are any SEO, I know we know some other agency folks and some other SEO folks uh, listen to the show uh, and so we, so that we don't get put on blast on social media. You know, Google does say that while EEAT itself isn't a specific ranking factor, right? So people will say, oh, you know, EEAT is a ranking factor. Well, I don't want to get semantic into it. Um, they do say they use a mix of the factors to identify content with good EEAT uh, when it's useful. And they specifically call out that topics that could significantly impact the health, financial stability, or safety of people or the welfare of well-being of society, the your money or your life topics... Um, that it can be particularly uh, useful in those contexts. And I will tell you, um, at our agency that's not in legal, we have clients that are you know, in the financial world, and we have seen that well-attributed articles with, uh, and Forbes is doing the same thing too. If you go, in fact, I'm going to use Forbes so I can be more specific because they're, they're doing it and they're a known site. In the four, if you go search for you know generic uh, legal keyword, and this Forbes uh, advisor pages come up, you will see that it is heavily quote unquote EEAT. And I do believe, in addition to the link signals that Forbes carries, I think that those the SEO team at Forbes is smart. And mm. if you want to learn, go follow what they're doing in terms of how they're doing bylines, how they're doing fact checking, how they're doing reviewing and marking the pages up so that they're telling the machine this is a well-researched uh edited reviewed by an expert page and i think that that's why that's part of the reason why forbes is benefiting from that we keep bringing up forbes forbes seo in legal is run by someone that you and i both know no oh, maybe we should talk about maybe we should talk I, about that later maybe we will maybe they'll, maybe they'll come to office hours Maybe they'll come to office hours. All right. Thank you, dear listener, for joining Guy and Conrad on another episode of Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. We have made this a more in-depth, although shorter, episode, and we'd love your feedback on that. Please send us feedback so the next time we can decide whether or not we're going to keep this format or go back to our typical double segment. Money makes a money makes a it makes a world go round. Yeah, money make a world go round. Yeah, money make a world go round.